You're listening to Food for Thought, a Food Enfolded podcast. Okay, I think we're on. I suppose a good place to start probably is to uh, maybe introduce yourself, Ray, and explain what it is that you do and your, your history. Okay, hi, I'm Ray Hilborn. I'm a professor at the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences at the University of Washington. I'm an ecologist by training got into fisheries about 50 years ago, um, working initially for the Canadian uh, government's Department of Fisheries, and uh, later working for one uh, international tuna research agency. And then I've been here at the University of Washington for about 33 years. My interest used to be probably the population dynamics of fish and the management of quotas. And in more recent years, I've gotten very interested in the comparative environmental impacts of different form of food production. And I teach a course on, on exactly that. That is, uh, uh, what are the costs of producing food from fish and from uh, terrestrial systems? And I know a lot about terrestrial systems in that I worked on farms when I was an undergraduate student going to university. My son is a farmer. He has farms about 500 acres about a mile from where I am right now. And uh, there was a time that uh, my wife and I actually owned that farm. Thankfully, uh, we don't own it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And uh, just to clarify, so we're here having this conversation today to hopefully clear the air around some of the, uh, the misconceptions around fisheries and the science that we see in front of us and uh, what the science is actually saying. So hopefully you can provide some insight on that. And I think, I think a, probably a good place to start with this uh, is a is a pretty big question, but um, one I hopefully you can you can share your insight on, and that is, is it possible to actually fish commercially and sustainably at the same time? Well, the commercially part really is irrelevant. That whether it's a commercial or a Aboriginal or a subsistence or recreational fishery, that's that's reasonably unimportant. Certainly, many fisheries have been managed sustainably for thousands of years, and I'd say within the ocean community, all but a few people would agree that, yes, fisheries, if properly managed, can be sustained. They can continue to produce food uh, as long as the ocean isn't. Uh, I mean, there's concerns about what global warming will do. Uh, some fish stocks may disappear under global warming or other forms of climate change. But if the oceans are are, are not totally transformed by, by climate change. Uh, there's no reason that many fisheries, you know, most of the fisheries in, uh, in Norway, for instance, can't be maintained forever. Yeah, that's, that's a very different uh, perspective than what you probably see, I think 99% of the time. You actually touched on something else there that I noticed, which was that there's, there seems to be a lot of focus on the fact that plastics pollution uh, is playing a bigger role than climate change or global warming in itself on these fisheries and the stocks? There are certainly some concerns, uh, you know, whether microplastics, which are making their way in the food chain, uh, may pose health hazards. Is it affecting the functioning of the oceans? I don't think there's any evidence that it's affecting how the oceans perform their major functions, whether it's oxygen production, whether it's carbon sequestration, or whether it's production of, production of food. But it's, I mean, it's not that we should ignore it, but it certainly would be very low on my list of priorities about protecting the oceans. I guess you're kind of thinking of things in like a kind of sliding scale, and this is not necessarily on the top of the list in terms of what we should be focusing our attention on, or? Exactly. If you, yeah. you know, I, if you, uh, in fact, there have been surveys of this, of, of people who, you know, ocean scientists, what do you think are the biggest threats to the oceans as we know them? And climate change comes out always by a, a, as number one, whereas in the public, plastic seems to come out as number one. Um, and climate change, ocean acidification, um, uh, exotic species, pollution, uh, you know, uh, um, overfishing is probably number five or six on, on, on the list. Because one of the things you have to remember is that fishing and overfishing and illegal fishing doesn't affect most of the marine ecosystem. That the, the, the base of the food chain is phytoplankton. 
<laughs> and we never fish phytoplankton. The next trophic level up is zooplankton. There's, there's minuscule fisheries on that. So the whole base of the food chain that con constitutes you know, 90% of what's in the ocean isn't it really impacted by fishing. And I, I, then again, I would contrast that with agriculture. Agriculture, what do you do? You eliminate the base of the food chain. You eliminate the primary producers, the trees or the grasses and the shrubs. And so, um, you know, if you look at how fisheries affect the ecosystem, it's very small compared to how agriculture affects the ecosystem. Even, even poorly managed fisheries affect the, uh, the ecosystem much less than any form of, of, or almost any form of agriculture. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, for, for context, um, I, uh, on a very novice level, but I studied marine science in university and that was, uh, I, even for us, that was not necessarily something that was in the, in the, in the spotlight. I think it was definitely, uh, yeah, as you say, plastics are front and center. And then beyond that, it's the impact on ecology of overfishing really. That's, that's, that's sort of what, <laughs> you know, that's where the focus has been for the, for the last, uh, 20 or 30 years in, in undergraduate uh, mm. marine, marine teaching. And so we've got this cadre of people who really haven't thought very deeply about um, what fishing does to the oceans and in comparison to what other forms of food production do to their ecosystem. If we were to stop all ocean fishing and, and change and, and, and instead replace it with the current mix of protein that people are consuming, you would need an additional area equivalent to the entire Amazonian rainforest. So what's the better trade-off, the impacts we're having in the ocean by fishing or eliminating the Amazonian rainforest? I think that's one that people would definitely be either one side or the other there. But uh, I mean, that's a fact. Yeah. You've got to produce the food somehow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the things that is, is least considered about this whole issue and is probably one of my key frustrations that I, I hear when people have a, a totally one-sided approach to the fact that we should have some drastic uh, and gargantuan shift to the whole food system and move away from these industries entirely is that you can provide that as uh, someone that's pushing them, but for the people that are being pushed by these uh, decisions that are not in such fortunate positions, I don't think there are necessarily alternatives that are actually going to provide that solution. So, um, yeah, probably yeah. not so one-sided to it. Uh, okay, I'm going to go through a few of these uh, a few of these quick ones. We'll discuss some of the things that came through the, the Seaspiracy documentary. Uh, one of them was that they, uh, they placed fisheries at a total collapse at 2048, and I'm aware that this is one of those kind of older studies that was thrown out and has caught a lot of wind. Um, is there any truth to that, or is, there, is it a little bit more nuanced than that? No, it's not more nuanced. It's just absolutely wrong. Many of the authors of that paper and I and a number of others did, a, a, you know, we, we sat down as scientists and said, okay, what do we really know? And we wrote three years after that paper came out, we published another paper with the same first author, Boris Worm, uh, showing that, in fact, where we had data, fish stocks weren't declining. Now, where we have data is selective. It's the better managed places in the world. But, uh, you know, there is no question that Europe will have fish in 2048. There's no question that much of the world will have fish in, in 2048. And in fact, Boris Worm, who was the lead author on that 20, All Fish Gone by 2048, has offered to hold a seafood banquet on December 31st, 2047. <laughs> And I'm, I'm really hoping I can attend because that day will be my 100th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> a fitting, a fitting way to go. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think they even exaggerated it further, further than that, to be honest. I, I believe they said it was empty seas totally by, by about the middle of this century. So That's sort of the it's... mythology that, uh, that has, has developed, that even that the seas are being empty. Um, for, again, the places where we have data, and we published a paper on this in 2020 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and this covers about a little over about half of the world's total fish production, the abundance of fish is increasing, not decreasing. The problem is there's another half of the world where we don't have good data, and probably the abundance of fish there is decreasing. But, uh, I mean, that's the... That's the, the problem with this, these narratives is they want to be global, 
but the story is very different in different places. And certainly in, in Europe, North America, most of South America, other places like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the larger major fisheries are doing well and, uh, and in, on average increasing in abundance. And that's, a, that's almost a total contrast. The, the Seaspiracy doesn't talk about the fact that almost all the great whales are, are growing rapidly or have, re have recovered to where they were before industrial whaling. Yeah, so it's looking a little bit better than uh, people probably have once thought, I assume. But I mean, that, that lack of having available data or uh, I suppose accurate data, is that something that you, you have trouble with in assessing these things accurately? Is that something that people can use to play into misinformation because you don't have necessarily all the data from every area? Well, it certainly helped. I mean, it's, a, it's an impediment. We, we just simply really can't talk about the global status of fisheries with a lot of accuracy, certainly not with the accuracy we can about that half where we, we have quite good data. Um, FAO is, is sort of the most authoritative, you know, so they're estimating that globally, maybe uh, globally, roughly 32% of fish stocks are, are overfished. Now, overfished doesn't mean collapsed. All overfished means is not producing at their maximum potential. I suspect that's roughly roughly right that it's it's something something like that. Um, but um, the, you know, basically, it's the the less developed countries, the tropical countries, which don't have the kind of research agencies you have in Bergen. You don't they don't have an IMR with seven research vessels. Uh, they don't have hundreds of scientists. Uh, we know a lot less about their fisheries than we do. Uh, about the, the developing countries fisheries than we do about the richer countries that actually brings us very fittingly to the next point i was going to cover actually was uh there was also reference to 90 percent of uh fish stocks being overfished or overexploited. but i I've, i have recognized that the source that they've used there is um is in reference to the fao study right and they've they've actually got that broken down to 61 percent that are fully exploited and 29 percent that are overexploited. so well they then they've changed the terminology from fully exploited to, I think, sustainably exploited. I uh, can't remember the exact term, but but a lot of anti-fishing groups have used that have 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 said ninety percent of stocks are overfished or on the brink of being overfished, which is fully exploited. Whereas, you know, the FAO's point is that fully exploited is exactly what the objective of most national fisheries agencies is: is to fully exploit, not to overexploit, but to fully exploit the. Uh, resources. And what does fully exploit actually mean for those who have uh, no idea about fisheries? It, it means being harvested in a range that produces long-term maximum yield. Okay, so if that is fished at that amount constantly, then in theory that stock could reproduce. Well, it's okay, you, you don't get a constant catch because stocks go up and down, but fished in a way that would produce the long-term potential maximum given year-to-year -year variation in environmental conditions. Okay, so it's not necessarily uh, an instantly a bad assumption to be fully fished. No, no, being fully fished is what national fisheries agencies yeah. and international RFMOs are attempting to do. That kind of brings us around to bycatch. That was another one that was kind of hit on quite heavily and 40% statistic of uh, some of these estimates placing 40% of global catch of being bycatch is that anything close to the reality, or is that? Uh... I mean, it, it you know, thirty years ago, it could have been approaching that. Um, now, I think the best estimates are more like eight percent, and that's due to several reasons. One is nowadays there are a lot more of what is caught is is used, particularly for aquaculture feed, <laughs> and. The other, the other reason is that there's been a lot of technological changes in how to avoid, avoid bycatch. So, yeah, it, it's an issue, but a, a way to put it in context is that in the, uh, in the terrestrial food chain, 30% of food is wasted. It's wasted from everything from being eaten by rats uh, in storage bins to... Uh, being thrown out in it past its use by date in retailers to rotting in people's fridges. And that, that's probably true of fish as well. So the, you know, the 8% at, um, at the production level 
it's it's a concern. It'd be nice to get to get rid of it, but it doesn't threaten the sustainability of using the oceans to produce fish. This is just a bit of a, a personal curiosity here, kind of following up from the fact that, uh, you, as you mentioned, it's quite hard to attain data from those less managed fisheries with less resources. It, 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 does that make these estimates hard, though? I mean, I'm just trying to think: how do we, how do you actually estimate something like bycatch if you've got, say, half of those fisheries? Uh, that aren't providing the data that you need to make those estimates. I mean, it's definitely hard. It's not something that I've I've done any of my own own work on. Uh, but there's a number of people who have spent a lot of time, and so these are these are our estimates. The thing the thing is that that in the places where the data are the poorest, so and and one of those is Southeast Asia, is they now use everything. Some of my colleagues, well, even I've been to ports in China and, and places like that, and everything that they catch is now used. So they've eliminated bycatch uh, <laughs> as, you know, as a concern of catching things and then throwing it uh, over, overboard. So there's probably more bycatch in the places we know about than in the places we don't know about. That's very interesting, and I haven't. Re- I, I think that's also something that's not explored too often is the fact that 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 total bycatch is also segmented down further into things that are repurposed or reused or resold in different uh, in different value chains. So it's yeah, as you say, it could be repurposed into feed for either agriculture industries or aquaculture itself. So yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. the low the, the basic generally the high quality fish goes to markets, fresh markets typically. The next level down uh, will go to make surimi, you know, fish paste, which is used for a whole bunch of things. And then the lowest quality stuff, which is often essentially slurry at the bottom of the of the hold, goes into aquaculture feed. Okay. And do you think that there's a place uh, for these kind of new industries that are starting up? I've just noticed there's a few, especially around Europe, there's a few of these kind of restaurants that are focusing on using bycatch to try and improve the value of bycatch as a means to reduce it. Do you think there's any, uh, any benefit to doing that? Is that realistically going to make a difference? Um, yeah, uh, I think, it's, I think it's, it's great. And I've been to restaurants by chefs who specialize in, you know, in, in that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot, uh, an amazing amount of underutilized fish in the world. Um, you know, I mean, here in the, where I live in the West Coast of the U.S., we only catch 25% of the allowable catch. To, to, and, and some of that is due to lack of markets, that we've just got resources that we can catch, but you know, they, they don't get enough of a price. And so I had a student whose part of his thesis was, you know, is there a way to, say, use those for food banks, to, to get those to people who, could, who are nutritionally deprived? So there definitely, yeah, it definitely sounds like there is a uh, a place for that, and there is some some space for development there. One last kind of statistic that I thought would be worth getting your opinion on was the uh, the cod statistics. I think it was on the cod and uh, haddock, saying that they will be declining by eighty, or they have declined by eighty seven percent and ninety nine percent respectively. I think for some people, hearing those numbers is extremely alarming, and they'll be thinking, how could we possibly be still seeing something with ninety nine percent population depletion being served in supermarkets and commercially fished but uh but that's that's totally wrong i mean the abundance of atlantic cod is growing it's roughly roughly where it was 40 years ago but it's growing it's growing pretty rapidly a lot of it is the the barren sea stock of norway but icelandic cod uh, some cod stocks uh, the southern cod stocks are not doing well they're they're hovering, and and one 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 cod stock. I mean, I, again, I I don't know where that number came from, but there the the, the uh, there's a large cod stock in eastern Canada, so-called northern cod, Newfoundland Labrador, and it did decline by ninety nine percent. It has recovered somewhat since then. So I, I mean, it's just a classic case of them cherry picking one number. They're not talking about the cod stocks that have doubled or tripled in abundance in the last 30 years. Yeah, they did definitely they did definitely use that statistic and they used one also they said the same for halibut 99% reduction rate and then they said some uh, some wild 
some wild numbers like a thousand percent uh, less likely to catch one now than you would be in the 1800s, which was another sort of strange cherry pick st- statistic. But it just, you know, it wasn't clear what stock they were talking yes. about. You know, the thing is, fish stocks go up and down. And so at any point in time, you can find hundreds of fish stocks that are going down. Uh, so you've really got to, you've got to look at the big picture. And that's what, you know, activist groups like this do is they go out and they cherry pick one, they cherry pick another and say, oh, this stock's declined by 70% uh, or 99%. But, uh, you know, it's the role of scientists to sit back and take the big picture and look across all the data and say, what do we know? And when there is, when that, when that, when you're talking about those individual stocks that, uh, and in a film like this, where they do generalize all of those into one kind of presumed mass, um, I suppose it's worth thinking about it. Do they, do they individually manage those stocks? Like will scientists employ certain measures for certain stocks to try and manage them if they have recognized that they are declining more than others? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, across the, 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 the rich countries of the world that manage their their fisheries, uh, you know, so in, 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 say, in the Eastern Atlantic, there are, I don't know, 15 or 20 different cod stocks that each of which is individually managed with an individual quota. And so the ones that are in trouble, the quotas will be much lower than the ones that have been doing well. Okay, so it's definitely individually managed. And uh, do you think that governments are willing to, to, to really address these things? And is it, is it the role of governments, I guess, to address these things or...? Yes, I mean, that's what, that's, they, they, since, since they are typically common property resources, uh, in some cases, international property resources, we really do have to rely on the governments to do these things. Now, what has changed is in many cases, fishing industries where, where governments haven't done it. Uh, in some cases, uh, fishing industries are stepping up because Nobody has a bigger stake in the sustainability of a fishery than the fishing industry, because that's how they make their living, the people who, who fish for their living. And, uh, and in many places in the world, fishing industry is stepping up to augment what the government's doing, both by doing, doing research, developing new technologies, um, uh, et cetera. And that's really what a lot of the eco certification is about is that in places like Southeast Asia, where governments haven't done a lot in the way of fisheries management, in some cases, the fishing industries are are putting what's called fisheries improvement plans together in order to to improve their sustainability, largely to get access to European and American markets. But Okay, interesting. Because they did definitely mention that as well. They talked about the fact that you could definitely not trust eco labels because they uh, they couldn't guarantee, they couldn't uh, actually prove that anything that they were claiming was happening at sea. Uh, there are always gaps in the system, but I guarantee you that fisheries that are certified by the Marine Stewardship Council are among the best managed fisheries in the world, and uh, the environmental impact of eating those fish is almost certainly less than the alternative foods okay that's very good to know actually because that's uh that's definitely something that is i think shaking the cage for a lot of people there because they've looked to that label and just assumed that that is a kind of tickle uh and w- when we're talking about governments uh subsidies were another one that they were they were mentioning as something that really dictates uh overfishing in itself and they felt that subsidies themselves handed out by governments were were kind of responsible in some ways for overfishing um, it, it even to the point where a lot of people have been calling for the complete abolishment of all subsidies for the fishing industry. But uh, do, you, do you think that this is a, a realistic solution? And what happens if we took away all these subsidies? Well, I mean, I would say, I mean, the, the first, there's a, we tend to distinguish subsidies into two groups, what are called good subsidies and bad subsidies. So almost all countries the government pays for the science associated with the oceans and with the management. And that's, you know, you could view that as a subsidy, but that is what the uh, people who work on that issue, you typically call a good subsidy. It, it actually supports the management of the fishery. But what are called bad subsidies are most commonly fuel subsidies, sometimes construction subsidies. In, in some cases, those will contribute to 
making the fishing pressure higher than it would be if they weren't subsidized. Now, again, in fisheries like European and American fisheries, where we manage fisheries by quota, that simply isn't true because the, the catch is regulated by the regulation, not by the economics of fishing. But uh, let's say Chinese supply fuel subsidies for their high seas tuna fleet. Yeah, there's no question that that is, is what leads to more pressure on the high seas tuna fisheries than would be in the absence of those subsidies. And when the Japanese dramatically reduced their tuna fuel subsidies, their high seas fishing effort for tuna went way down. I mean, there's general agreement that we should, we should get rid of fuel and construction subsidies, except in special cases for, you know, for special communities. But uh, subsidies are not the major cause of fisheries concerns, but to the extent they can be eliminated, it'd be a good idea. Okay, interesting. So I guess uh, all that would really be doing is raising the price of those fish. And if, if you are under a quota system where you can only catch a certain amount anyway, then those subsidies in theory shouldn't be having too much of an impact. In terms of those people that are advocating for changes in their in grand changes in dietary habits of say eliminating the entire industry of fisheries or say agriculture, um, what what do you think the ramifications would really be for those other countries? Uh, well, I mean it's 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 uh, I'd say it divides into two two groups. First for the poor people of the world, the hundreds of millions of people or the billions who depend upon fish for an essential part of the nutrition, they have no alternative. Okay, They can't afford to buy something else. For the rich people of the world, and what, you know, and then again, this is where I, 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 I actually have a, a friend who was the uh, head of conservation programs for, uh, in Africa. For, uh, for the right second, I'm switching here. Can you hear? I just switched headsets here. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, he asked me about. I remember it was in January of 2010. And he said, "Listen, I'm a conservationist. Should I stop eating fish?" And I said, "Well, if you don't eat fish, what are you going to eat?" And he said, "Well, I'm not a vegetarian. I would eat more beef, chicken, and pork." And this led me on what's been a major part of my research for the last. 11 years is what's the alternative cost of to the environment of beef, chicken, and pork compared to catching fish in the ocean? And there's simply no comparison. Uh, you know, that 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 catching fish in a well-managed fishery leaves a a functioning ecosystem that is very little different from what it was like in the absence of fishing, whereas more beef, chicken, and pork you would require enormous land clearance, enormous loss of biodiversity. Yeah, I guess that also brings into play uh, the whole aquaculture conversation now that things have seemed to move increasingly towards land-based systems. Um, I, I have my own opinion on it, but I'll, I'll hold it for now. Do, do you have any perspective on that as providing a potential solution? I know especially in a lot of uh, less wealthy countries that it is a big part of their it is a big part of their protein production. So, uh, and certainly aquaculture is, in, is going to continue to be to grow, probably to continue to be the fastest growing form of food, of food production. Um, but again, you can't just talk about aquaculture. So very high portion of global aquaculture is freshwater aquaculture inland. And another large portion is shellfish. Now, I mean, shellfish is probably the most sustainable food in the world, shellfish culture. You don't have to feed them. All They, they feed themselves. And uh, in terms of carbon footprint, production per area cannot be beat. Then with, within other forms of aquaculture, if you have to feed them, then the real environmental cost of that is the production of the feed. And that's where all of the critics of salmon farming get it wrong. So they talk about sea lice and they talk about uh, they talk about the, the little dead zones and the sediments underneath salmon farms. I mean, the total area of Norwegian salmon farms is on the order of the size of the Oslo airport. You know, it's, it's minuscule. The real environmental impact of the Norwegian salmon industry is where 
the crops are grown to feed them. That's, that's not trivial, but the thing about salmon is a salmon converts food to flesh more efficiently than a chicken or a pig or a cow. So that's why, uh, you know, I think that I would still say that a farm salmon is a more environmentally friendly choice than a beef chicken or a pork. Yeah, especially with Norway as the example there. I mean, the whole industry this year, I think, has just kind of grouped together and decided that they don't want to be sourcing their soy fillers for the feed from anywhere. But, uh, you know, uh, they don't want to support anything from uh, forested agriculture. So I think there's definitely positive steps forward in that space as well. Um, but it seems like uh, aquaculture and agri and uh, wild catch fisheries as well, it seems like the, the public hold a lot of resentment for the fishermen themselves or the the fisher women themselves. Do you, do you think that that is uh, something that's justified or are they being kind of unfairly persecuted here for what's happened uh, in the state of the oceans? In the, in the US, we have, a, we have a heroic image of the single fisherman, you know, and, and, uh, and we, you know, we have these TV shows, I, I doubt they make it to Europe, uh, called Deadliest Catch. And uh, there's three or four TV shows that are reality shows going out on fishing boats. So, so I don't think that we vilify individual fishermen. We, we tend to vilify the foreign industrial fisherman who's plundering our waters. Again, it's this break between the industrial fisherman and the, uh, the small scale fisherman that somehow small scale is killing a fish with a small boat is less impactful than killing the same number, of, well, killing a certain number of fish with a bunch of small boats has less impact than killing the same number of fish with one boat. And that's, that's a very common uh, misconception that somehow small scale fishing is always more sustainable than industrial fishing. Yeah, that's a very, I mean, I, I talked actually to a fisherman not too long ago, uh, back in Australia. He, uh, he'd worked on a, a, a few different types of fisheries or wild catch, and he actually had he actually had an, an opposing perspective that I thought he would have, and he was in favor of the larger scale boats because he was he was under that kind of impression that they were you know they were so heavily regulated when they were at that size that uh, he felt that the technology that they were using and the uh, the oversight that they have was actually better than what he was probably doing with the smaller boats and the smaller fleets that they were on. So uh, I don't know. I guess there's there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, the big thing is that it's that large vessels, certainly in the U.S., are, all have observers on board, independent observers run by the government, uh, whereas that's very difficult to do on small boats. So we know a lot more about the large boat fisheries than we do the small, the small, boat, the small boat fisheries. Um, but it's, 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 some, it's somewhat, it's somewhat con I don't want to come down on the side of one, one or the other. I think they can all be very well managed, uh, and and increasingly, the technology of uh, camera systems, satellite tracking means we can track. We can know what's going on in small boat fisheries. And I'm, I, I know a lot of fishermen don't like me to say that, but they just have to own up and accept the fact that they need to move to camera systems and vessel tracking. So we always know where they are, and we always know what they're catching. Yeah, why has there been such a big uh, refutal to that? Is it just because they don't? They you, do you think that there are too many people that are doing the wrong thing and they don't want to be caught, or is it just they don't like the the excessive oversight? Well, I'd say the first is cost. It does cost. Yeah, okay. Uh, cost money. Again, think of your independent fisherman who's out on the ocean. It's a you know the idea of having yourself on camera all of the time. You know, but you know, this happens to grocery clerks. It happens to all sorts of people in the world. And uh, you know, my attitude is: you're using a public resource. That's just going to be one of the costs of doing business, guys. Yeah, fair perspective. Very fair perspective. Uh, and for yourself, Ray, what do you think is the biggest kind of misconception that you you personally would hear about fisheries that's being constantly sprayed out there? And uh, would you? Well, that that a that it's not sustainable that the oceans are being emptied of fish and that somehow producing food on land is much more sustainable than producing food in the ocean. I'd say those are the, the three big misconceptions. 
Okay, and how? I mean, do you think that do- documentaries? Again, I hate to do that, but I, I, it it didn't it didn't feel a lot like a documentary. Uh, do you think that these sort of uh, mass media portrayals are are actually damaging to the to the industry itself, and are they damaging to the whole cause, even perhaps to the other side, to the to the vegan movement as well, because they do, in my opinion, kind of reduce a bit of the credibility of their argument when you approach it from such an angle. And so uh, to some extent, I'd say this is just like a bunch of mosquitoes b- biting. And, and I know the hijack, like Christina Hicks, I had an email from her. She had no idea she was even going to be in it. And, uh, and I think the uh, Marine Stewardship Council made the right choice and just simply refusing to deal with these people because they are so selective of what they actually show on the screen. You know, so they may film you for two hours and then just find some little snippet that looks embarrassing. I mean, Oceana came out looking really silly in that. Uh, and, that and, and, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, I generally consider Oceana an anti-fishing NGO. <laughs> so, uh, um, but uh, I don't think they're, 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 they're not threatening the existence of, of, of fisheries. Um, I think there's been a lot of damage to the aquaculture industry. It's very difficult, say, in the United States, to expand aquaculture, even though it's clearly a, a very low impact form of, of, of food production. Um, let me just add one of my other, one of, they, they, they made a big deal of this, uh, you know, uh, that, well, if you, if, you, uh, if, you have a, if you don't eat meat and fish, you don't, then animals don't die. And these people don't know how food is produced. There's estimates that, uh, that, that the number of vertebrate animals that die per acre to produce a vegan meal is, uh, is much higher than uh, what you w- how many animals die to have uh, a beef meal. That was definitely one of the arguments made as well, wasn't it, about, the, uh, about that Faroese uh, whaler when he was saying it's, you know, it's the equivalent of 2,000 chickens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to being more concerned about the life of a whale than a chicken. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, you know, from an animal rights perspective, I'm on, I'm on board with that. Just to wrap things up, we're getting on now. So uh, if there's any uh, final remarks that you want to leave or uh, final considerations for people or places that they can learn more, um, now's probably the time. Well, okay, we have a fact check website called sustainablefisheries-uw.org. Uh, we're actually putting together a full page on Seaspiracy because it had it required so much fact checking, but it it really is intended to be a source on real good scientific information on issues in in fisheries, and I would encourage everybody to look at that. Fantastic.